movement for Georgia O'Keeffe, a specific <coughs> movement. She's in America where you do not have these movements that publish manifestos and periodicals and identify, um, identify their stand through that. So we could call her an American pioneer of modernism. There's a, an important word I'd be looking for with O'Keeffe, and you kind of know she's going to be on that exam, don't you? And that word <coughs> is, the secret word is, biomorphism. Because we've been looking at complete abstraction in terms of hard edge geometric. But there's a flip side to that, right? The biomorphic, this other more elastic kind of language that is organic, that takes, is more animated in terms of curves um, and things that seem to speak or morph. Morph means form, uh, you know, off the body, off the idea of something alive and organic. Um, so instead of the right angle. And uh, I think that term, I'm kind of looking for you to develop that because that becomes her language. She's basically asking the same question separately from Maria. What is the underlying drama of nature? And she comes up with a different answer from the grid. She comes up with the biomorphic spiral. So she, um, and here's the famous line to remember with her, I look at nature and I see shapes. So for her, she doesn't have to have a hard edge geometric abstraction that is kind of, um, has a conquest over nature, that gets control over nature, that moves away from nature in one linear direction to a higher spiritual plane, as it does for Baudrillard. Well, yeah. For her, if it's or biomorphic, it's elastic. It's always becoming, it's always transforming, it's always a metamorphosis. So it cannot, it doesn't have to be either or, either nature or abstraction. It can be both and. So if I look at nature and I see shape, are American figures out how to be abstract? By looking at nature. That's a really different direction than our Europeans who basically are learning how to be abstract by kind of resisting and fighting against the academy and tradition. She, that she looks at nature and in nature, she starts to see shapes. So I've made a kind of a strong point that I think her work ultimately is really about seeing, about seeing the way an artist can. So she's not going to show us personal touch in terms of a gestural style. She's not going to do that either. Even though she works in curves, her curves are, um, her curves are very defined and have their own, in some sense, hard edge. It's just in the geometric, it's, it's, it's curved uh, in clear cut ways. But she does give us unique angles of vision, unique edges of vision. But it's not so much that it's about her unique edges, it's about how all of us can develop a way of seeing that's like an artist. All of us can look at nature and see shapes. She teaches you something about seeing. So um, that's one thing you can kind of work on and um, play with in your own thinking. Evening Star shows us that she's already breaking Mondrian's rule. Rules. It's not hard edge geometric abstraction with the right angle. It's that spiral, and she's picturing green. He had banished the color green when he develops his mature language of red, blue, yellow with three primaries and black and white. So she gives us a fuller spectrum of colors because, again, she has this elastic, more organic way. You remember, in her world, in the world of biomorphism, everything is becoming, nothing is fixed, nothing is a fixed being this and nothing but this. It's always uh, unpacking on more than one level and suggesting that it's in a dynamic shift. So Evening Star, we can look at it as a beautiful abstraction, or when we think about that title Evening Star, we can see it as something in nature. Um, so you can get it as a landscape, or you can get it as a kind of beautiful space-filling abstract picture. Uh, these are all early works like Coming on the Plains when she was teaching out in Texas, where you just get these sort of peak moments of vision, of revelation in some sense. We almost do, again, get a metaphysics where it's more than nothing but. You know, so she gets this sense of, of, of seeing shapes you know, uh, at a peak kind of moment of, of perception. She was inspired at this time not by going to Europe and studying European art. She was afraid of being influenced from outside herself by her teacher. She burned all her student work because she thought it looked too much like her teacher's work. And she didn't go to Europe at that time. She later would. 
But at this time, she was inspired by the writings of Kandinsky, and specifically that idea of synesthesia. Synesthesia, where one sensory stimulus triggers another, where you hear music, you see color, or vice versa. So this is an example of her learning from Kandinsky, learning from his writings, not from seeing his work. And um, she, this is work music, pink and blue. Uh, notice that everything has this kind of shape, everything takes on an organic shape, and already now this work starts to speak almost of a type of body scape as well. There doesn't seem to be any negative space in her work. Everything is filled, so she is a beautiful space filler. Now her flower paintings start to take us to her mature work. So draw a line under music pink and blue, from 1919, and that line should be over the top with black iris, 1926. Everything above that line is her early work, 1915 to 20. Everything below that line is her mature work, 1925 to 30. Again, let's just keep the dates clustered so that we're not messing with exactly what years. Instead, we're thinking about how they really parallel each other, right? 1925 to 30, between two year world wars, they each have their mature style. And we see that in her flower paintings and her skyscraper paintings, Black Iris being one of the first, the painting on the right. You can see how she challenges earlier paintings of flowers. It's not vanitas symbolism of things wilting. Instead, she gives us a peak vision, like a kind of peak, uh, perfect moment of bloom bursting forward there. Um, and she, she centers it in an iconic way. Um, what happens as she moves inward on the flower, she expands it, she blows it up. When she moves inward on the flower, she moves towards its sexual organs. Now, it, it's very reductive to treat the biomorphism of O'Keefe as being nothing but being about um, sex, being about um, uh, the female Center, centered vagina kind of imagery. Um, that would be one reductive reading. This is a beautiful kind of abstract pattern painting, space filling pattern painting. Um, it is also um, a work that can be read as, um, as a, a new definition of flower painting. It doesn't sort of play it safe in a feminine kind of way, but instead starts to speak of unleashed female sexual desire, where she owns her own desire. Instead of being an object of desire, she becomes a subject who desires, who has her own desire, and her desire is not just turn herself into an object for someone else's desire. That doesn't follow that. Um, she has agency. She knows what she's trying to do. Um, so the third way we can unpack it is it does start to speak of a bodyscape. And that bodyscape is curious because it is a way out of just picturing a woman's body as, again, a kind of desired object. The way out of that configuration is to picture the body as something lived in. And we use the term inner haptic, H-A-P-T-I-C, haptic, is knowledge gained through touch. So there's a sense of thinking about the body from your own position of desire, and that's as something you live in, not as something you see from a distance, not as a, um, a visual object. So that is what she starts to stress, the body as the thing. You said you have to do this knowledge of touch. Haptic, H-A-P-T-I-C, I'm trying to spell too. Um, is knowledge going through touch. Yeah, so it's a sensual kind of, uh, like we don't think about that, we think the visual is so dominant in our world. Uh, but the auditory, all these things are ways to gain knowledge and touch. So um, the body is something lived in and touched. It's a very different way to think about how to depict the body than, than typical figuration. I still think it's a form of figuration, though, um, but it, an interesting one at that. Um, all right, so. Well, we start to see that happening here with Black Iris. We will come back to some flower paintings, but this is the same time period she does Shelton with Sunspot. That's the building she lived in. She lived high, as high to the sky as she could. Um, she has to live in the city. Uh, you're also seeing the, um, the radiator building here. And these buildings uh, sometimes are talked about as American <laughs> precisionism. Again, movement. We didn't etch out. But in precisionism, usually it really is about uh, machine beauty. 
This machine really seemed to be what O'Keefe's okay, about. It's much more, I think, a kind of magical beauty that's talking about these transformations of looking out and seeing shapes, finding these extraordinary shapes and forms. Um, so she can kind of reduce certain things. We still recognize that building because she captures its shapes, but it's, it's how an artist can change that. And I, I just think a, a painting like this really hits home that it's about seeing, uh, about unique ways of seeing. When she said she turned the corner and saw that the sun had taken a bite out of the building, and then she paints in after images. That's painting in your vision. So that's what personalizes it for O'Keefe, but it doesn't make it all just about O'Keefe's vision. She's opening up a way for all of you to have unique edges of vision. Um, so that, it's kind of an exciting possibility. Now, uh, the flower painting and these skyscraper paintings all come from this period, 1925 to 30, and this is the Jack in the Pulpit series. It's three, three visions, and she's she does wonder around the way thinking in terms of series. But she doesn't have the same kind of hard edge geometric abstract system to her series, the same kind of rigor. Um, instead, with her work, it becomes more organic. This is a perfect one for showing there's no empty space. Everything is shape. Everything is full. You know, um, when we say bigger ground, nothing is background. Everything is shape and full. So she's a beautiful space filler in that sense. Uh, but we start with the flowers centered, and when she blows it up like that, it does make it kind of dangerous. It's like the, oh, like the canvas can't even hold these flowers, and they're about ready to burst their seams. And that's what creates this kind of idea, too, of uh, unleashed female um, desire. So we zoom in progressively more and more onto that central part, going into the center of the flower that's moving into the sexual organs, and the work seems to speak more and more about bodyscapes, about labia, or about the final one here of just a kind of orgasmic coming, you know, peak revelation. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, make us hesitate to not treat the sexual bodyscape read as the bottom line read. So I don't think she's on a hierarchy. I don't think when you work biomorphically, there's a hierarchy. Like this is this is a higher spiritual plane than that. Abstraction is higher than just pure representation. It's not like that. It's that everything keeps shifting. Everything keeps unfolding in many different ways. All right. Nature forms, the same time period as so many of those uh, Mondrians. It's from 1932, right in there. Um, but nature forms for her spirals, biomorphic spirals. And these can be landscapes, they can be bodyscapes, they can just be read as beautiful abstractions. Finally, there's a late O'Keefe in the way that we looked at near the end of the 30s. Um, you wouldn't have to really distinguish that, but she lives long enough to be, she was an American pioneer of abstraction, one of the first that we could say is an abstract painter in terms, in American terms, and what an American version of that would be, that is derived, it's an abstraction derived from looking at nature. Um, she becomes uh, also, in some sense, one of the first fantasy sort of surreal painters where there's a kind of magic realism. Um, and she was included in the first show about surrealism and fantasy that had the Kiritos and some surreal works in America. Cow's skull with calico roses from the far away nearby suggests this. You could start to look at them in terms of a little bit of Freudian dream logic. It's not that she's reading Freud or intending that, but you start to get this idea of the juxtaposition of the skull and the flowers. Um, and from the far away nearby, you get the way she plays with macro and micro. She plays with the very near and the and very distant and how she plays scale shifts. Probably very influenced by camera vision because of her husband, Alfred Stieglitz. Um, so uh, we see all kinds of magical ways of seeing, you know, new types of vision, like cameras taught us a new way to see uh, that really are enriching. Um, and she is, is uh, playing with all that as well. Um, remember, skulls for her are not about death. They're much too lively as forms, she tells us. So this is her way that everything is alive, everything is potent, everything is biomorphically um, and 